We're here today with Ken Moon, a Wharton Professor of Operations, Information, and Decision, and he's here to talk to us about some of his recent research. Ken, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you so much. So first of all, could you give us kind of a short summary of what you looked at, what were you trying oh, to find sure. out? Um, so I, I do research in empirical operations. So um, basically that means two things. One, I, I work with data, um, typically sometimes in collaboration with uh, companies, hospitals, marketplaces. Um, and second, I'm really trying to be uh, prescriptive about decision making in my research. Um, in this particular project, uh, we work with a, a retailer that's active online. Um, it was a very uh, detailed customer level data set. Uh, what's kind of interesting about it is that you can track a single customer um, both online and offline. So for instance, if the customer today were to um, go on their phone, look at a product, go to their computer tomorrow, look at that, and then walk into a store another day and actually buy it, uh, we would be able to track all of those things. Um, so it really opened up a lot of avenues to explore there. And um, I think uh, one thing that's very interesting about uh, this particular project was that we were able to look at a very uh, information-rich environment in a way that I think um, we see in our everyday lives. So not only can we browse in that way and have a lot more information, say we think uh, a product that we're interested in might drop in price, we can check our smartphone. Um, it's also the case now that uh, these companies can actually track all of this information uh, at a very individual level. Um, so it, for both sides, it's a very information-rich environment. And so it's very interesting um, to think about how does that affect uh, the decisions of, say, companies that are active in this sort of space, but also um, how does that affect outcomes for for customers and consumers. Right, I mean, price monitoring has really become kind of a daily part, at least of my <laughs> life, I know. So when you were looking at this data set, what did you find about price monitoring? Mm -hmm. um, I think one uh, sort of broad takeaway is that information seems to matter. Um, so you do have customers who are very intensive in their monitoring. Um, they're typically the more price sensitive customers, actually, but also their opportunity cost to be doing this sort of monitoring is very low. So they're going to be checking very often. Um, and your most price insensitive customers, actually, uh, they're not checking very often. It's about every 20 days on average between uh, visits. Um, so it's a very big difference in terms of how these uh, consumers are able to access information, even from this very uh, ubiquitous channel. Um, and, and it makes a big difference in terms of outcomes as well. Now, is there a clear indication of how companies should be doing this, like a, how they should be playing with price based on how someone's looking at and monitoring price? Mm -hmm. Should we be doing one thing, or does it depend on the customer, or? Oh, that's, it's, it's very interesting. It was, it was, that's exactly, uh, those are exactly some of the issues that we wanted to explore in this research. And um, uh, one of the interesting things that we found is that even in this very uh, rich, informationally rich space, um, uh, sometimes very simple, uh, policies and very simple decisions can be very effective. You can capture most of the value as a firm. Um, so to give you two examples, um, the retailer that we worked with follows a very simple pricing policy. For each product, you're going to start at a certain price, a list price, and then at a certain point in time during its season, you drop uh, the price down to its sale price, which is a very predictable percentage of that initial list price. And then finally, you move to another predictable price, a clearance price, where you're trying to just get the products out of the sh off the shelves. And um, what's interesting there is that the consumers understand what prices they'll see. Um, it's very predictable. Um, but all that the retailer did is to make the timing of those markdowns unpredictable. And by doing something very simple like that, um, it really uh, 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 exacerbated the informational uh, asymmetry in terms of the cost of monitoring. So those customers who are price insensitive, who um, it was very costly for them to be monitoring often, they were the ones who couldn't take advantage of a markdown when it happened. And they understood that, so then um, they would buy earlier. So there is uh, an interesting aspect there where um, this sort of pricing has an allocative role. You're deciding who buys at what price. Because it seems like, I mean, it seems like more companies, and maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that more companies have moved towards more unpredictable pricing. I mean, it used to be, it seems like, that, you know, there was there was the price, then it went on sale, then it went on clearance, and now it seems to be like, you know, one day it could be 50% off, one day it could be 30, the next day it could be full price, and then it could be 50 again. I mean, it seems like companies are actually moving towards that as opposed to predictability. And is that hurting them? I think it depends on the market. And an interesting thing is that um, in this sort of setting, we find that being predictable, being simple, 
but also having this um, uh, some degree of flexibility is actually the right way to go. So um, you are capturing, from the firm's perspective, uh, most of that value. An interesting thing there, I think, that you're sort of mentioning is that um, uh, if you think about an industry where that sort of uh, quickly changing pricing has been very successful, an example would be the airline industry, where uh, you might be on a plane and you sit next to someone who's paid a very different price for, for the same ticket. Uh, for instance, I'm pretty price sensitive, so I might have bought a cheaper ticket. Um, and the other thing in that setting is when they do that very successfully, um, the plane tends to be full, so they tend to be able to allocate all of um, the seats that they have. So that's sort of the price I think you pay for having that cheaper ticket. But the same message carries over into this setting. We find that when you do this sort of pricing correctly um, with these um, simple sort of policies, you're actually able to sell a lot more units. You're actually able to put more products profitably in the hands of more people who want uh, those products. And also, um, with these simple uh, policies, you're actually able to get more of those products into the hands of uh, the consumers who want them the most. Um, so there's an allocative uh, role there. So uh, I think an important message here is that um, from a consumer welfare standpoint, uh, this sort of po uh, pricing um, can have um, ripple effects that have positive implications. So if I'm a retailer and looking at this research, what are some ways that practical ways that retailers could kind of apply this or some sort of advice or takeaways that they could have from it that they could use in their business? Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think one is um, to, uh, to be able to understand why certain price uh, policies might work, including ones that you're using already. So in this case, um, our retailer, one thing that was interesting is we asked them, why are you using this type of policy? And they almost think of the customer sort of like a pet uh, or a dog where if you train them the wrong way they'll just start expecting to wait for a markdown. Um, so this was their way actually um, heuristically of uh, sort of uh, not training the customer by introducing this uncertainty making them unsure. But actually what we found is you have different types of customers who have these different costs of monitoring this channel and that's really what's driving um, what was good about this way of pricing. Um, so one is to um, if you have a lot of data, be able to understand, even with a simple policy, why is it effective? Um, and the second message there was that, um, again, going to the sort of uh, simplicity, um, that simp the message that simple works, um, in this setting where you were trying to, say, give coupons to your most price sensitive uh, customers, identify who they are, and you have this mountain of data recording all of their behavior online, um, what we find is that uh, there's some very strong signals from that data, so you only need a few things. Um, if you look at how people monitor online, the frequency with, with which they monitor, that's a very strong signal of their price elasticity. So um, you actually don't need to take, you don't need to always be using all of that information. Tracking something very simple like the ratio of purchases to visits online is actually a very strong signal and captures almost all of that value um, that you would have from uh, sophist uh, sophisticated analysis of all the data. And so what's next for this research, or what are you planning on looking at next? Um, I, th I think directly um, uh, the most related thing would be looking at these sort of informational costs, these frictions um, in a number of other settings. Um, uh, I'm, I'm doing some work in online marketplaces and, and other places where you can get very interesting data um, at the sort of granular level. Um, but more broadly, I think there are a lot of settings that are becoming much more informationally rich, whether it's um, firms that are able to track you online or um, uh, as a patient or in a marketplace or, or even in the workplace. And I think um, an important aspect of these changes is to be able to understand how does it affect um, firms who are sort of experimenting to see what can they do with this sort of data, but also how should consumers and workers feel about um, uh, how comfortable should they feel about these changes. So I think it's a very interesting space from a research standpoint. You get lots of data, so it's very interesting as well. And uh, um, I'm, I'm excited about it. Great. Thanks, Ken. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you.